Hey guys, GreatGamer34 here. So today we're going to be looking at AM, how to generate AM waves, what they really are compared to other types of waves, our carrier signal versus our modulation signal, that kind of thing. And then we're also going to look at um, how to rectify those waves that we generate back into our signal or some sort of similar signal wave. Obviously there's going to be some sort of loss when we do that in actual hardware. Um, and then we're going to amplify that and try to send that to some sort of speaker. And then I'm going to simulate that with a transistor amplifier. So I'm also going to introduce transistor amplifiers today and uh, it's actually going to be a common source amplifier we're going to be looking at along with uh, another set of transistors which act like mini like tunable diodes, I guess I should say. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So here we're looking at the wiki, and over here in this corner, in this box, oh, whoops. over here in this little box, uh, we can see we are generating a signal wave, which has some frequency, FM, we'll call that our modulation frequency. And then we have this, uh, well, it's not showing it, but inside here, this uh, frequency bouncing in and out is called our carrier frequency. The carrier frequency is the frequency that we're going to actually be sending this at, at in real life. So uh, an AM station could be 700 kilohertz to 1500 kilohertz, or maybe a little higher, I'm not really sure. And they have 10 uh, kilohertz gaps in between. Um, and each one is allotted 10 kilohertz, basically, that's what that means. And, well, the, and there's some, well, not a full 10 kilohertz, because uh, the bandwidth gets cut in half, they really only get 5, because of the way a, the signal generation works, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, so, then we, amplitude modulation is basically taking our signal wave, multiplying it by our carrier wave, that's all that is, and then we generate this AM wave. And the only difference between that and FM is FM, we're not modulating the amplitude, we're modulating the frequency, so we multiply this signal by its frequency constant instead of its amplitude constant, uh, or not constant for, for frequency, well, yeah, it would be a constant carry frequency that we base it off of, and then we modulate that back and forth to say how much we want, and that's why it's similar to phase modulation. But we're just going to be strictly talking about amplitude modulation today, and because of that, uh, because the amplitude varies, it's not power efficient, and it d doesn't have one constant power. Depending on the signal, you have to average the power over a certain amount of time and figure it out. Whereas FM, below it, its amplitude never changes, so it's got the same amount of power in its uh, signal. And so what's shitty about AM is you have a lot of energy going into the carrier because the carrier needs to be f able to uh, push the signal through properly. Whereas FM, you don't really have that similar issue and it's more power efficient. AM, on the other hand, is super cheap to build. And um, so there's multiple different types of AM. There's single sideband, uh, up, where you can use lower or upper sideband, depending on which one you want for single. You can do double sideband, where you use both. Um, there's vestigial sideband, which is similar, but not really. Um, and so what I want to show you guys here is this little chart. So let's say we have this information signal, and you see how it dips below right here, and then it keeps going like that. Then we have this carrier signal. What we end up getting is a moved up version of that. And we want to make sure that we can account for this phase reversal here properly, which means we never want this information signal to get below zero. So you'll see here, because of that, we do this right here. We want to multiply it by 1 plus mt. And so that all that 1 means is we need to offset it by some amount so that the amplitude will never dip below 0 here like it does. That issue where it dips below 0 is a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to DC boost the signal up a little bit and then amplify it by the carrier signal. And that should prevent the AM signal from going negative and having a phase reversal. So as we come down right here, you can see we have our base sig signal, and it's got some frequency components here, and then they decrease in amplitude to here uh, to some other frequency here. 
And then so we have, uh, of course, the reverse side of this too, because the frequency, negative frequency, you have to account for that as well. So we have this symmetric signal here. And it's at a low frequency, say a voice signal, uh, 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz, let's say. Then what we get, we're going to do is we're going to multiply that. Oops, we're going to multiply that signal here by a cosine. And what that does is it splits it up, and it splits the amplitude in half. So let's say if this is normalized to one, we get half that on each side. Then we have to take whatever the base frequency of that cosine was that we multiplied it, the carrier frequency, because it's going to be really high in uh, frequency so that it can traverse the uh, F at, uh, RF spectrum and penetrate whatever it needs to to get to its receiver. Uh, so WC is the carrier frequency. And normally we denote that FC, but this is the angular uh, velocity, whatever. So um, you just it's just uh, that's equal to 2 pi f or 1 over 2 pi f, whatever one is. Um, but anyway, so you ju there's just a 2 pi constant in there that you'd have to factor in if you want frequency instead of omega. But anyway, so then what we want to do is, you can see how there's two separate bands here, one on this side, or two on this side and two on this side. We could say we can leave them both, which is traditional AM. We can cut the inner ones out and have uh, upper sideband, or you can cut the outer ones out and have lower sideband. Um, and that those would be forms of single sideband amp uh, amplitude modulation. Um, so then the wiki goes over the power and efficiency spectrum, and as I explained earlier, it's not very power efficient, um, but it's cheap. So here they talk about the phase reversal here. So when we're modulated at 50% here, we have an overcompensation from this zero line. So our information signal is this dotted line, and we're able to account for it easily. As we shift our amplitude signal down towards zero, this is 100% modulation, where the lowest point of our signal hits zero. This is ideal here and you won't get any phase reversal. But the moment this gets shifted down past zero, where the lowest point on this graph below here was at zero, now it's below it, we get this burp. And that means we have uh, over modulation here. And that's what that plus one thing is supposed to do. It's supposed to say, whatever your amplitude is, you would multiply it by the plus one and the cosine. So if your amplitude's two, you have to offset it by two to prevent it from going under zero. So now we're going to go and look at how to generate back a message signal. Okay, so here we can see that we have an envelope detector. And all that means is we're going to try to smooth out this edge here as best as we can. And that means we have to use capacitors and capacitors discharge over time. Um, so you can see that we have some sort of AM signal that was here, and it was mo it was carried by this carrier frequency here. And so we're not going to be able to recover that super smooth, we're going to get this rippling effect here. But it should be good enough to make out speech and other stuff, so that's why AM is not so good, because you get that rippling, whereas f with frequency you don't, because the amplitude doesn't change with the frequency modulation. So we can see here that we get this input here where it's the signal times cosine of omega c t plus you know an offset if you wanted to do some if you wanted to add an offset and it could change with time um, then our v out here is a constant k times this function here that we multiplied it by so this is just showing that we're recovering that signal by some other constant that's you know because of this r c and that's that proportionality constant. Anyway, so here we can see we just have a diode, and that's rectifying it, so we don't want it to go negative. That was that thing with the amplitude modulation, we couldn't have it go less than zero, so it had to be, you have to add plus one to the signal. So that's why there's a diode there, it's to prevent the negative stuff. And then here we get this uh, RC circuit here, which is basically going to charge up the capacitor and then discharge, charge up and then discharge, charge up and then discharge, and charge up and then discharge. And that generates our output signal V out. And then basically what we could do is we could send that right to a, a headset, a, a micro, uh, you know, speakers or something. But uh, it's not really designed to 
be loud at that point because all you're going to be doing to get this input signal then is relying on an antenna right here coming from the positive and then do this going to the ground. And so if you're trying to get all your signal out of an antenna, your amplitude is going to be really low. It's going to be in the milliwatts. Um, and so you're not going to have this really loud speaker. So let's try to then amp see if we can amplify a signal like this using transistors. And instead of using a diode, we're going to use a diode tuned pair that act like a, a tunable diode instead. So I will explain that, and then you'll see that we have this. So basically we have this input stage here, which is a diode tunable st uh, circuit made out of two transistors. Then we'll have a transistor for amplification, and then on the output we'll have this RC circuit here to actually smooth the signal. Alright, so something else that I wanted to point out is engineers, uh, even though we have to take a lot of math courses, oh, look at that, that's showing the burp right there and amplitude modulation is kind of funny. Um, anyway, uh, even though we have to take a lot of math courses and a lot of calculus courses and stuff like that, that's just there to get you a feeling of why the stuff works the way it does. When it comes to actually engineering, you're going to use a lot and a lot of tables. You're not going to sit there and calculate the Fourier transform for everything. Although you can and you often do derive the simple ones, uh, you use the tables just for the quicker maths, just to solve the problem at hand. You're n once you're in engineering, you're, you're trying to solve an engineering problem. You're no longer just trying to solve math problems. Um, so because of that, we just resort to tables, and so you can see here we have the operation, the theorem, the operation, the function, and then the transform. So the function in time, and then the Fourier transform equivalent. So we can see if we multiply some by some constant alpha by in t, we scale the time by some, and the frequency is scaled by some value, and the, the val and it's also the amplitude of that frequency is scaled. So um, these are just different uh, tables that we use. You can see here that we have a rectangular pulse, it transforms to a sine pulse, or a sync pulse, sorry. We have a triangular pulse, and that transforms to a sync squared pulse in frequency. Um, we have these exponentials, um, then we have the sync in uh, time, which goes to a square wave in frequency, and sync squared in time, which goes to a triangular wave in frequency. So you see these inverses, they're, they're very, it's very nice and pleasant to see those. Uh, I think that's quite, the symmetry is quite awesome. Then we have, you know, phasers if you're sending a phaser. But I prefer sinusoids because, you know, you, you rarely ever work by sending phasers. Um, we have a signum function, which is basically, it's either negative one or one. Um, or you can apply that to j, where it's either negative j or j. Um, we have some waveforms here to see what it, the coefficients are. Um, similar things here. These are the Fourier coefficients. Uh, here we have some trig identities, once again, because you basically need to know these. Like if you have a signal of cosine uh, omega ct plus phi of t right there, then you'd have these this formula here to break it up and whatnot, so you have to basically know what those are. Here we have some Bessel functions, and the Bessel functions are needed when you're doing frequency analysis, so we're going to ignore those for AM stuff. Um, we have some nice summation identities here, so if you see any of these terms when you're doing Fourier coefficients, it's just easy to expand. Uh, some integrals here, and then we have some literal tables, like some old school stuff here. Even though we have calculators in MATLAB, uh, you still get the tables here with an x, sync x, sync squared x. And then we get some transition tables here, where this goes down like this, and then it continues up here and goes down. That's the way that works. Um, we have some complex identities here. Um, how to get the angle, which is the inverse tan of the imaginary over the real, or also known as inverse tan of y over x. You're literally, it's just the angle. It, they, they call that the argument. Um, this is showing you that the power is taken by taking the limit as t approaches infinity of this uh, over some sort of period. So you're, you're, so you're taking 
you're you're taking a certain amount of time and then dividing it out by that time, but then letting that uh, go to zero at the same time. So you're you're averaging out. That's a it's an integral's average, and you'll see that a lot without the one over t in the limit, and then that's a that's a different form of power. Um, but then we'll see it with like a magnitude there. The Fourier transform of that signal right there. We have v of t, you just multiply it by e to the minus j, 2 pi f t. Um, more of these, uh, this is just defining what that means. A rectangle post means we have a 1 for a certain amount of time and a 0 when it's not that time. And then here, this is saying we have a slope of some value defined by these arguments here for this time, and we have no slope for this time. And this is the absolute value of t, so we get that symmetry on both sides. Um, and then some other signals. Equals by definition, approximately equals. This is a integration over a period where it's, it's really arbitrary. It doesn't matter where you take it. Um, and then here's you know binomial coefficients, but. Uh, you don't really use those that much, um, and then uh, especially if you know it's Pascal's triangle. But uh, anyway, um, the d noting a Fourier transform, yeah, you'll see that sim symbol also saying here's from frequency to time and time to frequency. You, you have a transform pair, and then there's another set of tables here. So here we see more about uh, an AM signal, and so basically. If we have a signal that has some frequency component, let's say it has some uh, positive valued frequency components, so we're going to ignore this left hand side and we're going to just look at the right hand side. We see it starts with some amplitude in frequency at, at DC, which means it has uh, some power at zero frequency. And then as frequency goes up, it get, goes up in power. This is the magnitude, by the way, just to. This means it's only plotting po positive, and then um, it goes up and then goes down in frequency. So this is our signal that we generated. It has these frequency components and they're continuous. And we can see that the argument here is saying it's positive, 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 negative, negative, negative. Or it's, it's, sorry, it's negative, 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 positive, 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 like that. But it has this odd symmetry about it. So for the negative frequencies, we have positive um, angles. And for the negative or for, and for the positive frequencies, we have uh, negative angles. So we have this anti-symmetry there, and that means our signal is real. And so what happens is when we take our real signal and we multiply it by a cosine. So let's say we spoke into a microphone, we generate a signal, and now we're going to try to send that signal over the air. We have to multiply it by some frequency that's really high in the RO spe spectrum to generate that. And when we do that, we split into two different signals. This is where those Fourier transform pairs comes in handy. Because when you multiply by a cosine, you have two impulses that form at FC, this here. And then the signal is plus the W and minus W are centered around FC. And since it splits it to two, you get half free, uh, amplitude at both sides. Um, just moving through here. Um, here's that signal again. Here's a better label. No, it's the same thing. Never mind. So here we have a message signal. The, the amplitude of the message signal has to be less than or equal to 1. The power of that signal is get denoted by this, where we average over t. So here's that thing. That's, and then we square the signal itself where before we weren't squaring it, and then that was a different constant. Or power, or whatever. Different form of power. Um, this tells you the bandwidths, the different types of modulations that you can do. AM, dual sideband, single sideband, vestigi vestigial sideband, are considered AM because their message alters the carrier amplitude. However, AM implies conventional AM. So when you talk about AM, you're talking specifically about conventional AM. And then conventional AM, or simply AM, is our carrier frequency, or, s or carrier amplitude, multiplied by 1 plus our mu x of t cosine 2 pi f c of t. 
x of t is the signal that we're trying to send by some constant. Um, and then cosine 2 pi f c of t is the frequency of the cosine signal that we're going to generate and try to send it at. So if we want to send it at 700 kilohertz, f c is 700 kilohertz. Here we can see that we generated this input signal, but it's it goes negative here. So what we actually do is we bump it up by adding 1 to it, like this, so that it doesn't go negative anymore. And then we're able to capture it. But when we don't do that, we can see that it goes negative here and we get this little burp here, and it's called a phase reversal. Um, moving on. Oop, there's that phase reversal. We get it right where it goes negative and we don't boost it. And then uh, we go into dual side, uh, yeah, double sideband, I believe, is coming up next. And I don't really feel like explaining that too much. But here we have a transistor. They don't show what type of channel it is. Although I've never seen it with it going into the gate like that, so whatever. Um, yeah. This is a uh, AM modulator. This will generate the AM signal that you need to do to create. So A is the concept, and B is actually how you implement that using a tank circuit with a tuned resistor, tuned capacitor, resistor, and uh, inductor circuit, RLC, and then the different modulations. So I just wanted to go over that because I, f I felt it was good background information needed for what I'm trying to do with my device. Okay, so before we get in too far, I first want to explain a little bit more about amplitude modulation, AM here in the top left. Double sideband or dual sideband AM, vestigial sideband AM, single sideband AM, and then we're going to ignore quadrature amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. We're going to ignore those for now. Um, Actually, no, we can go into QAM. We, we, we'll, we'll cover QAM a little bit. Anyway, so here in standard AM, which is what I'm trying to recover, we have this 1 plus mu x of t times cosine of 2 pi f c of t. So normally you were seeing omega c. Uh, so omega c is equal to 2 pi f c. And so we like representing everything in frequency because when we take the Fourier transform, we see that really easily. Um, so if we take the Fourier transform of this signal here, we get the amplitude divided by 2 times a delta function, which is just an impulse. It just means at this specific instant in frequency. And that free instant in frequency is the frequency f minus fc. So you'll see that as f minus fc right here. It's this guy. Then we have f plus fc as this guy here. Then we have f minus fc, ux, and then ux, f plus fc. So then we're, we're modulating them up and down by some mu factor. And then of course we have everything on the negative side as well. Um, what dual sideband here does is it gets rid of that one mu x of t factor, and then you just you don't have this carrier frequency here you have um, just the outer edges, you have the dual sidebands of it. Vestigial sideband in the frequency, similar, but you have these amplitude differences here. And single sideband, you can just pick either the inner or the outer, depending on what you want. That's why you have two sets of different Fourier transforms here. You can pick either the plus or the minus, as denoted there. But by default, the minus uh, comes first, and then you can uh, multiply by negative one there to get the plus. Um, and so like there's different ways, like there's different things that are good about these signals. And I didn't really cover the amplitude spectrum. I was just looking at the phase. But uh, here in AM, you can see the amplitude across a spectrum of frequency here is constant. And we have an impulse of power at the frequency of the carrier. 
In dual sideband, we don't have that carrier frequent, uh, impulse of amplitude here. Same in vestigial sideband, and the same in single sideband, and the same in quam. So you'll see here that we have a bandwidth of 2w, that's because it takes up, if this is w, then this is 2w, and so we have 2w. This is also 2w, because of our carrier frequencies here, it has to be on both sides. This one here is in between w and 2w because of this sloping. This one is just w because we're picking one side, and this one's 2w. But if you look here, there's always a trade-off between bandwidth and power. And the SFT just means power. And sometimes the power is a function of the signal that you're generating, which in AM is the case because the amplitude is changing, which means you're putting more power into the signal. So here we see we have the power of the, sig of the carrier frequency plus the carrier frequency modulated by the input frequency. And so we get this term plus another term. In dual sideband, we get rid of this first term. So we're not wasting a bunch of power just generating the signal. We're um, using most of our power to actually send information. Here, however, we have to take a uh, the, we have to take the Fourier transform, I believe, or the Laplace transform, depending on what you're in, to get that function. And then here, in single sideband, we see that we get even better. It's not half AC squared SX, it's ha a quarter. So here we're saving even more because we chopped that in half by only taking one side. And then in quadrature amplitude modulation, we're able to send two signals. That's why it takes up two W. So it's the same as this one. It's almost the same in the fact that this one can send one signal in W, this one can send two signals in 2W. Um, so similar bandwidth for both. But this one, you have to modulate the power across two different signals here. And we're using QAM, which, is, uh, which means you're using the cosine and the sine because they're offset by 90 degrees and they won't interfere with each other. And then, yeah, I'm not getting into FM. But anyway, here we can see how we modulate it, well, that's called AM modulation. To produce this, we need a product modulator like that. Vestigial sideband, it's like that. It, these are just like the block diagrams for it. I don't really want to go into them. But then the demodulator here, we can see is that, that tuned, we see a diode here, and then this capacitor circuit here to rectify it. And so that's how we detect an envelope. That's, that's what that's called, envelope detection. And so here, to generate it, we have to do all these things and where you see it says coherent that means we need to be synch synchronous somehow we need to have the synch the frequency of our recovery signal match the frequency of the of the carrier frequency of the incoming signal and get the phase to line up that that's uh matching those phases in theory we just say oh they're they're synchronous but actually getting that to happen is much harder than it's than it uh than it is th th than the undergrad teaches, so I'm not going to be able to do that. But so that's why we do non-coherent detection with AM. F it should be easy enough. And then this just goes into some ways to do some Fourier transforms and stuff like that. Oh no, this is uh, Euler's identity expansions and just testing. Yeah, testing to see if you can compute it. Um, and then a review of, constant, of complex numbers, but I hope you guys know that. And uh, so yeah, let's get a look at some transistors. Okay, so here is a textbook that I have up. It's some, some microelectronics book that I use for court in my, one of my courses. Um, and in one of the earlier chapters here, they go over a basic common source configuration. And so I'm going to be represent, I'm going to be implementing this with JFETs. And when I build it in real life, there'll be JFETs instead of MOSFETs. Um, but MOSFETs are just nice for the equations, and uh, it's easy to look at. So basically, what we have is this is our input signal, and this is the amplification sig uh, source. So let's say we put 9 volts across this from ground up to here. So we're going to give it up to 9 volts to amplify, and depending on what we tune RD and R1 to be, that's how much amplification we'll get. That's going to be our gain, we'll call it. And so. If I have my input signal of AM coming in at maybe peak of 2 volts to, to 0 volts, which means it's offset by 1 volt and has an amplitude of 1 volt, if that's my input signal here at some frequency, I want it to come out at that same frequency, 
but I want it to be shifted up in some amplitude by some amount. And that amount that it gets shifted up is the diff is the uh, the f ratio uh, a ratio between these two transistors or resistors here. And because of that we can tune them properly and then do a small signal analysis. So let me scroll it through here. And we are doing some s voltage gain here, which is a V out over VI, our output signal versus our input signal. And that's uh, given by this equation here, where GM is the transconductance of the transistor that we're using, which is a constant usually given, or we have to calculate that with another formula, which is pretty simple. Um, and then it's RO in parallel with RD. So if we come up here, we have our input resistance looking in to the output of this transistor. We have to take that into account in parallel with RD. We have to look at that, and then we get that we get uh, that signal right there. And so if we take that signal and multiply it by the RI over RI plus RSI, which is RI over R, um, I think I'm looking at the, oh yeah, they're, d they're doing this, uh, you tune the RI, RSI. So they're doing, um, I believe RI is some combination of these and RSI is this. I'm not really sure what they're calling RI because they don't really give it, which is nice, I guess. Um, and so here we actually have to calculate the conductivity parameter for the transistor to see if we are trying to d drive a certain amount of uh, current. I don't really care about how much current I'm trying to drive through this. I care about being able to boost the voltage out a certain amount. So here we can see a load line for that transistor, the parameters, I don't really want to explain that too much. And they do the AC analysis here and they say that we get negative 6.58 gain. So here is a similar thing and this capacitor here is to uh, block out any low frequency components. We basically don't need that DC offset once it gets in here. We need that DC offset for the signal generation, but then we, we basically say, no, get rid of that, and then amplify it. Um, so to generate the signal, we need that DC offset, but then once to work with that signal, we don't anymore. And so that's what the, this capacitor is doing here in every, every one of the circuits. Um, yeah, um, so let's actually take a look at my circuit. I will use N-channel JFETs, and uh, so it's going to be a little different from this stuff, but it's going to look roughly the same. Alright guys, so we can see here, this is my circuit that I used, or that I designed to, uh, well first this here generates an AM signal into my circuit here. This here, if in real life, would be this would be where the antenna is hooked up, this this rod, and this would be the tuning circuit meant to pick up the signal and keep and tank it back and forth um, as the signal came in and keep it bouncing around here. Um, so this is a variable capacitor, so it has a line through it, and that's so you can tune through different stations. Um, but I'm I fixed the capacitor at one right right in here to match my sinusoid frequency and my my carrier frequency here to pick that up. By it, the, the equation is 1 over 2 pi square root LC, where L and C, you just enter those values. And so if, if I wanted the frequency to equal uh, 10 kilohertz, I had to set that frequency equal to 1 over 2 pi LC. I locked L at 200 microhertz, and then I calculated capacitance value off that. And anyway, so that what that does is the capacitor value stores up and then discharges across the inductor, and the inductor then discharges across the capacitor and we get this back and forth at the frequency of the carrier and that kind of locks it in there. What we see here is that diode, that tunable diode I was talking about and th th that's done with the, with the rate, uh, length ratios of these transistors and then we have this capacitor which does a DC block. So basically here in my signal, 
if I click on this, you'll see that we have a DC offset, and then we have an amplitude of 1. So we have a DC offset of 2, so that puts it at 2 volts, and then amplitude of 1. So that goes up to 3, and then down to 1. So we're above 0 with our carrier. And if we look at our frequency, we have or our modulation frequency, we have an offset of 0.5 volts and an amplitude of 0.5 volts. So that, that stays above 1 as well. So now, what that does is that signal passes through. Now that it's been kind of, uh, this is the envelope detector basically. And then we amplify that signal here using a common emitter a transistor amplifier. So the way this common emitter works is depending on how you set up this voltage divider will give you the gain that you want. This is set up here to boost to about uh, 7 volts to 7.5 volts and we're on 9 volts here um, and I didn't want to use up I didn't want to hit the saturation point of the transistor so that any higher of a resistance here would start messing with the transistor so this works out to be the best ratio that you can get after some experimentation and then we have this circuit here which rectifies the signal and generates it across the speaker so I will run this and we will take a look at the simulation so if I simulate this, and we don't need node 3 in there, we're just going to look at node 4 before we rectify it, we'll notice some pretty cool stuff. So we're going to run this, it's going to take a few seconds. And so our input signal is at 10 kilohertz, and our modulation signal is at 1 kilohertz. So let's look down here, and we see this. This is a much lower frequency than this. So what we do is we multiply those together and we generated this signal. And this signal is called VAM1 because it's the voltage of the AM signal that we generated and it's produced by volt multiplying the carrier frequency here which is at 2 volts and goes up to 3 and then down to 1 by this other one which goes up to 1 volt and down to 0 volts. So this uh, modulation never hits below 0 and we're giving some power into our modulating signal so that we can send it. If there was no power in our signal, we can't really send it across space. So, once we do that, we generate this wonky, wonky looking signal, which looks like this, but it's modulated by that AM signal inside it. And you can see we don't cr ever cross zero, so we don't get a phase reversal here. Whereas if we crossed zero, it would then create a burp right there. And then, this output here is a rectified version of this input. And there's a little bit of a time shift on it from its peak because of the nature of how the circuit works. But it's at the same frequency, which is all that matters. And so you can see that the peaks and the troughs don't line up exactly, but they're in the same frequency. They repeat at the same, often, at the same amount every time. You can see here across this distance here, they're the same and then across this distance here, the same every time. And so this is showing that we have boosted to about a peak of 8 volts and roughly a minimum of 4.7, we'll say, 4.8 volts there. So our input signal, we only put 2 volts in, and our output signal, we got a full amplitude, a uh, full, what is that, what, 5 volts boost, I would say? So taking a look at this again, let's watch what happens when we add a third input signal. Okay, um, so I guess I don't have the one with two input signals for some reason. Um, I don't have it built, so I don't feel like messing around and building it. But anyway, if you guys have any more questions on the circuit, and or want to see when I build it in real life, because that's going to happen soon, actually have to do a project for a course and I have to do two projects for a course and uh, actually the first one was build or was simulate a circuit that has at least three active components so that's what uh, these three transistors are they're three active components that's what that means um, and so I had to simulate it which means of course I had to generate a signal which means I'm probably going to use this similar signal off a frequency generator um, to actually ge test my thing here but then what I'm also going to try to do is I 
I was in my car the other day and I was listening to AM stations to try to find the best one. I found like 950 kilohertz AM. Uh, that was a station that came in quite well in where I'm from. So I might uh, try to do it actually off that, which would be cool. But first, I'm definitely going to test with an os oscilloscope and a frequency generator. But then I'm definitely going to try to hook it up to an antenna and see if I can get it to work. But uh, the uh, the project here was to simulate a circuit and then I'm going to have to build it. And so when I build it, uh, I can post a few videos if you guys are interested in it, but if not, uh, let me know, whatever. If you like the video, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.